So, now we get into the terrain. So, before I get into the hard code, I'm going to go with the high-level logic. So when the player actually does this, they have a terrain manager, which they say, terrain manager, load terrain. Which is in here, load resources, load resources. You can see terrain manager, load terrain, terrain main, sand, the height map, and all the varying number letters. Or all the <laughs> attribute values. It's the exact same thing that we do for the rest of our asset managers. That was just a map with a string ID, texture extension of .tga, for finding it in the, the files. And then asserts for if you, the user does anything nonsensical. Then once that terrain exists, it will now be up to the terrain manager to decide who gets used. Which, okay, here, terrain manager. The terrain manager is largely very straightforward. He just has a pointer to the null terrain, which I just made another terrain object that literally has nothing. Terrain object null. Nothing. Um, and then I did a terrain object parent just so I could have this draw that's empty. Um, then when it's first started, it creates that null object and sets the current terrain and just draws whatever the current terrain is. So if the user sets the current terrain up here, it'll move it to the one that's currently being drawn. And also you can do get, ter get current terrain. So a lot of the collision management type stuff will be saying get current terrain. So if the user ever does get current terrain on a null terrain, you can get it. It's just not going to make much sense and probably only going to be prone to weirdness. I haven't fully <laughs> tested what happens if the user doesn't assign a terrain and then does it. But yeah, it'll, if the user does it, it's going to give them the null terrain. And what, depending on their logic there, it, depending on what they try to do with it, it's not going to make a lot of sense. So when they actually create it, let's go into the logic here. The actual terrain object has a, oh boy, functions on functions. Holy moly. I was how big this guy is. Terrain creation work, there's that function. This is the same file largely that you saw from the graphics class. The only difference is once I do all the this is all largely the same code. Like I start at the I start in the for this one in the bottom right, go left and up. Which just made my math a little bit easier, because it was just you just do plus equals for exposition. Just made things nice. Because right handed space is weird. I believe that's right. Yes, that is correct. Um, the only thing I added now is I now have... Where is he? The train cell, this little guy. Which he has his own collision volume, um, the index for the vertex in the top left, and the triangles. I'm not sure if this is entirely necessary for these guys to... I'll be here, but I found it was a lot easier, and I figure it's probably easier to do all this math up front instead of having every single enemy recalculate this. It's basic math, but I'd argue it might save it something in the long run. So I just go through and just create all these cell datas and give them all their which vertexes they refer to, which just has a little function. It's really basic math, but it's just easier to do a ton of that up front and then never have to worry about that later. Then do the same thing for the triangles, and then you create a little collision volume for the triangle, compute the data, and you save it. Then you delete all the unnecessary stuff. Um, the actual math to do this for the... Okay. So yeah, that math is largely straightforward. So now the way I do it, or the way I work with this, is everything I do runs through this get row and get column which will give it a world Z and a world X, and it'll convert that into a cell position that I'm using in for the same 2D array. And then all further functions are now going to interact with that cell. So when you do like get, oh, those guys are, that's what's called. So visualize cell from grid, you just show collision volume, terrain data, row, column. That's why I really like this. So you can do visualize cell, and you give it a position and a color, and it'll do get row, get column, and visualize cell from grid. So yeah, it makes this nice cascading effect of converting from a world position to just a row and column. And the row column has all the collision math you want. Uh, visualize triangles, yeah, there's visualizers for days in here. Um, okay, so before I go any further, I just want to show level one. Yeah, set terrain, terrain an example of how to use it. Now, 
when we go to collision, sorry, one moment, let's take a second to find so many files, tests, terrain. So when you're doing the terrain, you have this terrain iterator. This is a little object that just has a, a um, it essentially defines a block of cells that you want to interact with. So you just do the set iterator, and you get the B sphere and the terrain iterator. Um, the iterator you set it equal to the current terrain. Yeah, sorry. You tell the terrain the terrain you tell the terrain iterator to match the current terrain, and then you tell it to match to this B sphere, and that will give you the 2D series of grid cells to work to. And then you do what was that end? And then it will just walk through all of them, all the potential cells that'll work. So while not is done. That's just there in case, I don't know if a user ever did anything silly where they just kept trying to plus plus on it, it'll just ignore that. It won't give you impossible cells or go outside of its range. So it'll just keep going through each column. And once the next one just scooches up a column. Yada yada yada. That's the set rectangular area, that's how it knows. So this little cell, the train iterator guy, is how it actually knows which collision volume to interact with. So you do collision train iterator dot get collision volume, and that will give you an actual AABB, which then you could just run through the old math of just get collision volume, and now you just do process callbacks, which I s fully see, Andre, why you're saying that this is unnecessary for having a dispatch for a single object because it ends in this, <laughs> which just kind of looks weird, making a dispatch just for this line. I believe that is super high level, but. Yeah, um, I did the more advanced barycentric one just because I felt like it was more straightforward once you understood how it worked. So yeah, you'll see a lot of the naming systems I use the exact same beta, gamma, then there's this just awful gobbledygook. So yeah, you can get the beta, get height, and get normal at position, it'll just return a vect normal and a height at the position. And again, this just keeps referencing that 2D array of cells. I can prove this works, as you'll see my player is actually using this. In his update, he does his movement, whatnot, yada yada yada, gets his height, his current height, and then he essentially asks the terrain what the, his height should be. And he'll scooch down later on over here. Oh, sorry. Then he checks if it's, um, I put a max climbing elevation. My intent was to bound the player into a certain region of the map. So like they can't scale like mountains. So if the height difference is too big, you can't move there. Then here's the math where I just get the normal position and then do all of that gross math to just get a world matrix out of that normal in my forward, which I will show you is working. I should have built this before I showing this video. My apologies. Holy moly, we made a lot of class files. Okay. Come on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I have buttons and fun little text now. So I have a title screen with a high score system. That does work. So you can see the player runs around. The enemies do the exact same thing. Um, the tankless is supposed to be in my suicide truck, but that didn't work out. So, yeah. Very boring enemies. But you can see everyone's following the normals of the train and the height of the train. 